Hey everyone, it's been a long while since I've done a Gloomhaven related video, but I'm back with the Diviner Solo Scenario Guide. Now, some of you may be asking, where is the Diviner Solo Scenario? To answer that, you will have to play Forgotten Circles for yourself. It is unlocked through the campaign, and I'm not going to spoil exactly where. Uh, however, if you do have a physical copy of Forgotten Circles, it will be in your scenario book. You just need to play through the campaign until you eventually unlock it. So today's video will spoil a few things. Obviously, everything the Diviner solo scenario will be spoiled as well as all Diviner cards and items up to Prosperity level 4. With those spoiler warnings out of the way, let's get started with looking at the scenario. The objective of this scenario, you start in the top room and you're supposed to move all the way to the bottom right room and guide your four rift tokens to the destination hexes marked with the blue stars. Along the way, there are monsters and your objective is to not let your rifts die or your uh, own self die either. Uh, yes, the rifts, the rift tokens in this particular scenario are targetable by monsters. So that is going to be quite interesting. What sort of character will we be playing? Well, obviously we're playing the Diviner, but um, we are going to play it at level 6. So this is the maximum level we can play while still retaining scenario level 3 at normal difficulty. I think this is the optimal level to do the scenario and it gives us the best chance of completing it. I will also pick um, Diviner cards uh, according to the choices I would have made if I played the Diviner in Forgotten Circles. Uh, obviously, this scenario would be a lot easier if you can pick and choose exactly which Diviner cards to use, but I'm going to pick those that I would have chosen um, during normal level ups. That is to say, I'm not optimizing my card choices for this scenario. So in this case, the level 2 to 6 cards that I'm going to pick uh, that I would have available to me are shown on the screen right now. As for items, I am going to limit myself to items uh, that are prosperity level 4 or less and uh, make a lot of sense on, on the Diviner herself. So these are, in my opinion, items that most Diviner players would go for anyway because they, are, they help the Diviner a lot um, in the Forgotten Circles campaign. The Stamina Potions, for example, are a huge help in increasing the... Diviner's longevity as well as the healing potion. That way the Diviner won't die because during the Forgotten Circles campaign, should the Diviner die, the scenario autom is automatically counted as a loss. Same thing with the Cloak of Invisibility. By staying out of harm's way, the Diviner can live longer. Finally, Boots of Speed are the pair of boots that make the most sense on the Diviner in my opinion. Because she uses Teleport to get around pretty frequently, you don't really have much use for boots that increase your... Uh, movement range or boots that allow you to jump instead of normal movement. So without requiring those two boots, the next best one usually would be the boots of speed that allow you to tweak your initiative. Very useful when you're using rift cards and certain support cards like shielding your allies. We are also playing with nerf stamina potions. So for those of you unaware, uh, starting from I believe the big box expansion to Gloomhaven and onwards, I believe that's Frosthaven, it might be Jaws of the Lion. Either way, uh, the designer, Isaac Childress, has officially decided to nerf the stamina potions such that they recover one fewer card. You don't have to play with those rules for Forgotten Circles, but I will restrict myself to those rules. So the minor stamina potion will only recover one discovered, uh, discarded card, major will recover two. Right, skill build. Um, so we have to pick nine cards to play with for this scenario. And as we know, our objective is to move the rifts across the map. Therefore, our top actions are mostly going to be filled by rift actions. That's how we get our rift across the map. So I'm going to bring our three rift cards that we have available, Inspiration from Beyond, Void Snare, and Cursed Ground. We are also bringing Preordain the Path um, so that we can move all our rifts uh, using a move tool in one action. Uh, because rifts are considered allies in this particular scenario. 
the good thing about picking all these cards um, is that we will consistently move at decent initiative. Uh, the Diviner's Rift cards are usually between the 20 to 30 initiative range. So we can consistently move at that initiative and expect that uh, we move before the monsters most of the time, which is pretty sweet. So that leaves us with our bottom actions, which uh, most of which will be dedicated to movement. After all, if we are playing for the objective, we want to get to the bottom right room, the final room, as soon as possible. So we want to bring our big movement cards, our teleport force, obviously, but also seal their fate has a move 3 on it. And move 3 is pretty valuable for door opening. With teleports, you cannot teleport into a new room because uh, new rooms are unrevealed. So the furthest you can teleport to is the door. Therefore, having a move 3 allows me to move further into an unrevealed room, which is pretty nice. Unfeebling Hex is the final bottom action we are taking, simply because it um, allows us to muddle all enemies, reducing the damage output of them, which is pretty useful in a scenario where we don't want to die. Alright, so as far as scenario difficulty goes, I would say that the Diviner Solo scenario is fairly challenging. I mean that in a good way because it is not frustrating. It's certainly not as difficult as some of the other solo scenarios of the, the other characters, in my opinion. In fact, I would argue that the toughest part of the Diviner solo scenario is not so much the strategy itself, but rather completing it without committing a rules mistake. I dare you, I challenge you to do this, because this particular scenario has numerous special rules, many of which create novel rules corner cases. So one way or another, you are going to mess up the rules. It doesn't help at all that the vinyl cards are complex by nature and have easily forgettable restrictions. So you are bound to make a rules mistake here or there. In fact, you might just find one in this video. And <laughs> I'll apologize for that, but there are <laughs> so many rules you need to take care of. Right now, I'm going to run through all the easily missed rules I can think of. Uh, it's going to be a long list, so feel free to skip right ahead to the gameplay section. Um, the gameplay itself was my fourth attempt at the Diviner's Hollow scenario. The first three attempts were forfeited not because uh, my, I came up with a suboptimal strategy, not because uh, I got unlucky with uh, card draws or monster ability draws, but simply because I made a rules mistake in each of those three uh, playthroughs that was not reversible. That is, <laughs> yes, that is how challenging the scenario is. It's all about the rules mistakes. And yeah, I just could not um, in good faith say that I've completed the Diviner Solo scenario if there are rules, if it's, you know, peppered with rules mistakes. So for your sake, please be very aware and vigilant about rules mistakes because they will happen, trust me, right? So let's start the list. Rifts not within three hexes of you are vulnerable. In this particular scenario, you have a three hex safe radius uh, where your rifts cannot be focused on by enemies. However, anything outside of that is fair game. Uh, this is super easy to forget because uh, rifts can move outside of a safe zone if you place rifts too far forward, right? Range four or further. Or if you move your character ahead into the next room, forgetting that there are rifts in the previous room that can now be focused on. So during this playthrough, I'm going to uh, avoid the mistake by coloring rifts that are focusable, that are vulnerable, uh, with a pinkish shade, such as the one that you see um, here and here. They are of a different shade of pink uh, than the other two rifts, so you can tell by that that uh, these are vulnerable and enemies can focus on them. All rifts are vulnerable once the final door is open. This is a special rule um, that happens as soon as you open the last door. Other things that happen is that you can move up to two rifts that are within four hexes of you from the door uh, to empty hexes that are adjacent to you at the door. You can also perform a heal three on all rifts that will not move this way. Don't forget about that. Alright, the next rule. R vulnerable rifts can be focused on, just like the diviner. Um, the issue here is that in the scenario book, the rifts were not given an initiative value. So for the purposes of Monster AI, I'm going to treat the rifts as though they have the exact same initiative as the diviner herself. 
um, and rifts, as we know, are not your summons, so they do not move before you, they do not um, draw monster aggro um, before you. So because of that, I'm going to assume that uh, in cases of ties such as this, where the Valraf Savage can choose between the Riff at range 2 or the Diviner at range 2, it is up to the player, i.e. myself, to choose where the Valraf Savage goes. Next rule, you can lose cards to prevent rift damage. So if your rifts take lethal damage, the game is not over. You simply lose a card or two from your discard pile. Rifts has six hit points at this current scenario level. Rifts are immune to conditions. This means that they cannot be immobilized by the earth demons, but it also means that you cannot cast regenerate on them. You cannot cast invisible on them. So that's very important to keep in mind. Rifts can move through other rifts, but they cannot end on the same hex as another rift. So you should never have two rifts uh, stacking on top of one another at the end of a turn, right? But you can move rifts through each other because they are allies. And you can also move through rifts yourself, of course. Now there is a rules um, ambiguity here. Can monsters attack rifts from range 0? The example here is this Vara Savage which is currently standing on a rift. This situation can occur if the diviner, for example, was previously within the s if the rift was pre previously within the safe zone of the diviner within three hexes, but then the diviner moves out of range for whatever reason. Once the diviner moves out of range, that rift, that particular rift here, becomes vulnerable to attack. The question is, can enemies attack rifts that are in the same hex as them? This is a novel situation because, yeah. Uh, in the normal campaign and even in Forgotten Circles, as far as I know, there are no situations where a monster would stand on top of an enemy they can attack. So, uh, given what is written in the rulebook, I'm going to be very pedantic here and read the rulebook word for word. Um, melee attacks can only target adjacent hexes, and from the FAQ, adjacent hexes uh, do not count hexes do not count your own hex. So, the Varaf Savage in this situation has six adjacent hexes, all the hexes within range one. But the hex that it is on is not adjacent to itself. Because of this, I would rule that a melee attack cannot target anything at range zero. Uh, this does contradict with another passage from uh, another section in the rule book, which says that. Melee attacks have a default range of 1 hex, which means they typically target adjacent enemies. Uh, the main keyword here is that they have a default range of 1 hex, and by definition range means that you can hit anything within that range, 1 hex or fewer. Um, to resolve this, that, that's just, this is why it's ambiguous. Uh, you can't really resolve it because it kind of co contradicts each other. Uh, in this corner case, but I would say that the first se section overrules the second because uh, this talks about monster range values and monster melee attacks. You can only target adjacent hexes. How, what if the uh, monster is making a ranged attack? Now that's a different story. Ranged attacks, as defined in the rulebook, can target enemies within Y hexes, and within of course includes zero range. So I would say that if the Vara Savage is performing a ranged attack here, it can hit the Rift token, and in fact, because it is not adjacent to itself, it will not gain this advantage against the target. To gain this advantage, it must be exactly one hex away, it must be adjacent. So because of this pedantic rules interpretation, my uh, assumption is that this Vara Savage cannot perform a melee attack on the Rift, but it can perform a ranged attack on the Rift without this advantage, which seems very incredibly counterintuitive, doesn't make common sense at all. So yeah, um, I'm. Pro this is probably not the intended ruling, it's just my strict interpretation of the rules. At the end of the day, however, because there's so much, amb so much ambiguity, I would just recommend playing it in whichever way makes the most sense to you. You don't have to follow my rules here, these are just conclusions that I came up uh, by reading uh, the rule book word for word. Right, so with that out of the way, um, more rules um, entanglements. Monsters suffer damage whenever rifts enter the hex or whenever they enter a hex with a rift. So this is a special rule for this solo scenario. The amount of damage they take is always 3 regardless of scenario level. But please note that you cannot place rift tokens 
on hexes occupied by enemies. This is because for your rift cards like Void Snare, they must be unoccupied hexes in order for you to place rift tokens there. In order for you to move your rift tokens into enemy hexes, you must use something like Preordain the Path, which allows you to move your rift tokens uh, using normal movement rules. Next, monsters are immune to all other sources of damage. They can take 3 damage from passing through rifts, but they cannot take damage any other way. This means that they are immune to attacks, uh, although you still carry out the attacks because attacks may have secondary effects such as elemental infusion or um, you know those uh, modifier cards that give you shield or healing. Um, also, no self-immolation, so wound damage does not deal damage to enemies. Um, any modifier cards that says enemies suffer damage? Well, they don't. Uh, also, hazardous terrain that you see in the scenario do not count as damage towards enemies. Rift cards themselves have ranges. This is another thing that's very easy to forget both in Forgotten Circles campaign as well as this solo scenario. Cards like Void Snare and Preordain the Path have a limited range. Uh, so uh, the destination hex for the Rift must be within that range even though you can pick up any Rift token on the map. Those are not restricted by range, but the destination hex has a range restriction. They must also be, be within line of sight. Anytime you see the range symbol or the range keyword, uh, it means that you have to have line of sight to the target hex and you must follow range rules, meaning that you don't count through walls. You must count around the wall. Um, most of the time, for the purposes of this solo scenario, you wouldn't place rifts further than range 3 anyway, because if you do, uh, they will become vulnerable to monster attack, which is what you want to avoid. Finally, there is an ambiguity with using Preordain the Path. Yes, I'm quite aware of this. Preordain the Path reads, you and all allies within range 3 may perform move 2. So even though Rifts are your allies and they are eligible to move to as a result, it does not say that you can control the action, the movement. So that is the ambiguity here. Are you allowed to move the Rifts? Um, yeah, are you allowed to control the movement of your Rifts using Preordain the Path? Because your Rifts, even though they are allies, they are not your summons and they do not have a focus. Normally, if NPCs have a focus, then the movement must be according to the focus rules. Uh, there are two interpretations for, to this. Uh, it's quite ambiguous, so I just decided to go with one of the imp interpretations, which um, leads to you know a favorable outcome for myself. The first interpretation is that you can say that Rift tokens are NPCs, and as a result, they have no focus, and uh, hence they will not move. I choose to go with the other interpretation, which is that thematically, Rifts belong to the Diviner herself. Thus, it makes sense that by playing a card like Preordain the Path, she can control their movement. Honestly though, again, this is up to you. You can play it whichever way you want. Um, the rules here are quite ambiguous. As I mentioned earlier, the solo scenario does not address a lot of rules, creates a lot of corner cases for rules without addressing the ambiguity. So. Yeah, just play it whichever way you want. I'm just pointing these out. Um, and yeah, that's about it as far as rules analysis go. Um, if you've played the solo scenario before, you've probably tripped out on one of these rules before. Well, let's see how I attempt it. Uh, it's time to head into the game itself. Alright, so let's get into the solo scenario. We've set up the board here and we've already played our first two cards. Uh, Revitalizing Font and Void Snare. Uh, uh, key in my initiative, which is the one on the left, 21. Um, just a reminder, this is where the Rift tokens start. All Rift tokens within range 3 are safe and cannot be targeted. Everything else is fair game. And whenever the Rift token passes through an enemy or vice versa, the enemy takes 3 damage. Otherwise, there's no way to damage the enemies. So let's go, first round. Oh, that's really interesting. I've never seen that card before. Alright, so they strengthen self and they perform an attack which misses. However, um, the two damage that they would usually suffer does not happen because they cannot be damaged any other way than risk passing through them. Alright, so normally what I would do here is to use... Normally I would use the rift bottom here and the rift top here to move the rifts into position such that they will 
uh, you know, uh, threaten the Vara savages, but it looks like I'll need to adapt my plans here. Instead, what I'm going to do is to move into the next room and bring a rift with me thanks to Void Snare. I think I will take... Uh, right, these two rifts are safe. Let's take this one rift here and move it within range 3 of myself. Alright, so now this is the only rift that is not within range 3, so let's uh, color it to indicate that that's the case. So this rift is now vulnerable to attack. Alright, and now all my rifts gain disarm for this round, but this doesn't matter. I don't think any enemies are going to pass through that rift. Now before we resolve the Earth Demon's turn, we have to turn to the Vara Savages in the new room, who also gain strengthen. And then we'll finally deal with the Earth Demon who performs a move 1, attack 3, target all adjacent enemies, there are no enemies, and no push happens because there's no Earth. Next round. Yeah, this is a very weird turn 1. Honestly, I don't think the model will do much, but I'll just play anyway. It's all about getting the rifts in position. I will play this rift here. So I'm going to key in 28 as my initiative. Right, so the Vara Savages are moving too, and the Earth Demon is doing nothing. This is pretty ideal. Alright, so let's resolve that, starting with myself. Inspiration from Beyond. Place one Rift token on any unoccupied hex within range 4. Um, yes, let's extricate this Rift because I do not want it to be targeted by the Vara Savages. That would be pretty bad, so we'll move it here. And now it's within range 3, it's no longer vulnerable. So now we have the Bless effect, which will probably not matter. Enfeebling Hex, Muddle, target all enemies. Uh, strengthen effect, again this probably will not matter. And Darkness is generated. My turn is done. Do I want to recover any cards with my Stamina Potion? I think I do. I think uh, the Disarm Rift is going to be quite important here, so... Let's get Void Snare. Back into play using my minor stamina potion. This also gives me an even number of cards in my hand. That's pretty good. Alright, so that's the end of my turn. Varaf Savage, move to attack 2, pierce 2. For convenience, let's resolve the monsters in the first room first. Um, move 2. Now we'll resolve the 2 at the bottom, starting with the smaller number. Varaf Savage 2, move 2. Finally, Earth Demon heals itself, it's already at full health. Next round. Alright, I took this back for a reason, we're playing it again, Void Snare. I would actually like the bottom action to be seal their fate. I see. I think this is the time to move my initiative up by using my Boots of Speed. At the beginning of the round, decrease my initiative value by 10. So now I'm at initiative 20, I move before the Vara Savages so that I can get my Void Snare in effect. Ooh, the Earth Demon is doing something really nasty. Ooh, shite. Yeah, that's pretty bad. That cannot be helped. Alright, um, I think I'm going to make a crazy play here. Now, the rules state that as long as the Rifts are within 3 hexes of me, they are immune to targeting. And because of the wording, within 3 hexes rather than range 3, I take it to uh, mean that it counts through walls. So if I move here, this rift is still within 3 hexes. 1, 2, 3. Right? Uh, normally it's range 4 because if you count 1, 2, 3, 4, you have to count around this wall. But because it says within 3 hexes, I take it that this rift is safe. So I can actually move to this tile. Uh, to, th to this hex rather, with my seal their fate. That's a move 3. Uh, I perform a range attack, but there are no targets within range 3, so I forfeit the attack. And then I'm going to use Void Snare's top. Place one Rift token within range 3. So all the Rifts are within 3 hexes of me, they are all immune to targeting. That's good. Valraf Savage, move 3. 1, 2, 3. It moves through two rifts, taking six damage, and it takes the disarm from Void Snare. 
Next, number four. One, two, three. Same deal. Finally, Varaf six. One, two. It cannot move the third step because the door is blocked, but it does pass through the rift, so it gains this arm. Earth Demon stays where it is, performs a range 4 attack on nothing. Alright, I think this action, this set of actions makes the most sense by far. Let's draw. Ooh, very good. The Earth Demon's not moving at all. That is perfect. Alright, so we are going to start with... Cursed Round. Place one Rift token on any unoccupied hex within range 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. We'll place it here. And we activate the curse effect. Dimensional transfers bottom, teleport 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. Can I do better? I am pretty sure this is better. I'm pretty sure this is better. Alright. So we'll do that. Um, and that's done. We are not going to use any items. Earth Demon heal 3, does not matter. Varraf Savage, move 3, attack 1, range 3. So only the first Varraf gets the range attack, the rest are disarmed so they'll move as though they have a melee attack. Starting with number 1, move 1, move 2, move 3. It'll move in this way so as to get the range attack on myself. It's within range 3, it'll perform the attack, 1 damage. Alright, so now my Diviner's down to 10 health. Now the rest will move as though they had a melee attack. Starting with number 2. 1, 2. It moves through 2 rifts, taking 2 curses. Oops. And proceeds to die because it just passes pass through 2 rifts. Number 4 will move 2 to get into melee range. It could also move 2 this way, but I believe it will... Uh, prefer this path as it requires fewer hexes uh, to reach melee range. So unfortunately this means that it does not pass through any rifts, it does not take damage, it does not take a curse. Finally number 6, we'll perform move 3, 1, 2, 3, that's straightforward, and turn. Right, uh, this is not within range of me. I'll play my last two cards. And thankfully the initiative is terrible, but they do have very high range. Alright, um, everything is going to perform a move 2 and what I'm going to do is to use these, this move 2 to kill the Varaf Savages. So starting from the topmost rift, I'm going to move 1, 2. This will cost this 3 health. I'm going to move this rift 1, 2. This will cost it 3 health. I'm going to move this rift 1, 2. <laughs> 3 health. And I'm going to move this rift uh, 1, 2, and this will kill. And then with the combination of the teleport and my own move 2, I'm just going to move myself here. And that ends my turn. The Earth Demon is going to plod along for 3 steps. Finally, it moves near the door. And the Varaf Savages will now impale themselves. Starting with number 1, 1, 2, 3, it will suffer 9 damage and die. 1, 2, 3, it will suffer damage and die. I think I'm in a suitable position to take a long rest. Oof, the move demon plots a hit, generating earth. Now I get to perform my long rest, I'll need to think of what cards I want to recover. I do get my boots of speed back because I took a long rest. Alright, I thought about it. Um, at this juncture of the game, uh, we'll, we notice that there's still a lot of movement to be done. I need to get the rifts into position quite far away. So obviously I need to ke keep all my top rift actions, my Void Snare, Inspiration, my Cursed Ground, and my Preordain the path that allows me to roof move all my rifts. So I'll ha what I have to give up is a bottom action. I have two teleport actions. I have a move three, which is very useful for opening doors. Uh, so it's down to the last two. Obviously I want to be able to have the option of moving a rift using my bottom action with Revitalizing Font. So you know, by process, process of elimination, it has to be an Enfeebling Hex that takes the cut. So that's going to be our first cut. We recover 2 health by virtue of the long rest. Let's continue. Alright, this might sound crazy, but I think, judging from the board, the best course of action here is to actually make a beeline for the objective. There is no point in wasting time trying to 
um, you know, get everything in position. There's no point in trying to juggle the Earth Demon around. So I should breach this room as soon as possible using the move 3, which will get me... Oh no, I can't get there. Uh, no, I can still move here. Move 3 gets me here. And then I'll, I can perform a teleport 4, which immediately gets me into the final room. So I think that is the fastest way to breach uh, that room. So with that in mind, I think I will perform a move 3 here using Seal Death 8. Of course, the problem with moving so fast is that my Rift Tokens will be exposed. Right? Because they can't keep up. So to make them keep up, I'm going to preordain the path. Alright. Uh, wow. The Earth Demon's moving a lot. That's really bad. That is quite bad. I really don't appreciate the big hit, but we'll, we will, we'll let it happen. Anyway, if I do get into the next room next turn, there's going to be a heal that fires off anyway. So, we are going to perform the movement first. Move 3, we are going to move into the new room. 1, 2, with 1 remaining movement. We expose the Vara Savage 5, that's an elite Vara Savage. It draws the best possible card. It does not draw a movement card, so it cannot attack me. So I can move safely in front. And resolve, preordain the path. Right? You and all allies within range 3 may perform a move 2. So I'm going to move 2 all my rifts. I'll start with the closest one. Move 2, move 2, move 2, move 2. I get a move 2 as well, so why not? I'll move this here. And what this does is allows it allows me to keep these two rift tokens within range 3. These two are exposed. Right? Now the earth demon proceeds. 1, 2, 3. And it will smack my rift. 4-4 four, four damage. Minus 1. 3 damage. So it starts at 6 health. My rift token is now down to 3 health. Alright, at this point, I definitely want to teleport 4 into the new room. And... Bring a Rift along with me. Let's go. Far Rough Savage is a move 2, but it's a very strong ranged attack. Um, if I move into the new room, I'm going to review two normal Far Rough Savages as well. Those are move 2 and range 3, so they do not have the range to hit me, but the elite Far Rough Savage can. There is not much I can do about that. But I do have 11 health anyway, I can definitely take soak a hit. So that's fine. What I'm more concerned about is the rift that I'm about to take. Because I'm going to obviously pull this rift to safety. And this is a pretty safe spot for melee attacks. But if any of them draw a ranged attack, then that's pretty bad because they can hit the rift from range. I'll just have to take the risk here. I just realized what the Earth Demon is doing. They are targeting all adjacent enemies. So by taking that away, I'm exposing the other rifts to being multi-targeted. I would rather take another rift with me. I'm getting a free heal anyway, so it's not a big deal. Wait. Instead of using Inspiration from Beyond to place my to drag my rift into this corner tile, I can actually move it to the other corner tile. This is the safest tile on the map. This is incredibly safe. So I will do exactly that, and then perform a move 4. Let's revisit what happens when we open the door to the final room. You may immediately move up to 2 rifts within 4 hexes of you to empty hexes adjacent to you. Any rifts that did not move recover up to 3 hit points. And all rifts can now be focused and damaged normally. So if I open the door, all rifts are fair game. I do not drag any rifts next to me as part of opening the new room. And I am done with these actions. Do I want to recover any of my old cards? I still have Void Snare. I think I am good on cards. I will recover them later. My turn is done. Far Rough Savage. The Elite moves first. It performs a range 3 attack after moving up to 2 steps. I will have it move 1 step towards me. This way. And then it will perform a range 3, attack 3, that's a plus 1, 4 damage. Now the normals get to move 3. Neither are within range of me. Earth Demon. 
it doesn't move, it simply attacks. Attack 3 on this rift. Plus 1. So that's 4 damage. I'm down to 2. Alright. Mm. That is bad. That is very, very bad. The Earth Demon is doing really bad things. Uh, the Vala Savages are okay. Oh, I do not like this. I really, really do not like this. This is very, very bad. Yeah, I placed my rifts in a very nice pattern, so... Had I extricated the middle rift instead, you know, it wouldn't have the pattern. That was a misplay. I, I did not realize this card existed. That's pretty bad. That's my bad. Um, hmm. I think it's still doable. It's just going to be very dangerous. So, I'm going to start with Cursed Ground. Place one Rift token within range 4. I'll bring it to this pseudo safe hex. And activate the Curse effect, which does not really matter. Then I'll um, perform a Teleport 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. Before I end my turn, I have a few orders of business to make first. Actually, you know what? I'm just going to use everything. Except my Boots of Speed. So, first, Major Stamina Potion. During your turn, recover up to two discarded cards. I'm playing with um, the modified rules. Right, I think I will just recover a Teleport card and a Rift card. There's not much else I can do with what I have. So that's my Major Stamina Potion gone. Major Healing Potion, heal 3. And Cloak of Invisibility gives me Invis for this round and the next. So that will be useful. And that's my turn. Used up a lot of items there, absolutely necessary. Fire up Savage. Now that I'm invisible, they will only target my Rifts. This is the whole idea of this plan. Fire up Savage will move towards 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Or 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2... Yeah, it will move towards this rift. So, 1. And the other Vara Savages will move 2 steps out. And the Earth Demon will do its thing. So it will move 2. And perform the AoE attack. Attack 3, starting with the nearer rift. Shit. I lose a card. That's really bad. I will lose my Rift card. That is really, really bad. Oh gosh. Uh, yeah, I need the teleport. I'll lose the Rift card. Just had to draw a times two. Um, next one is uh really okay. Oh, uh, that's <laughs> that's awful. Not gonna lie, that's really awful. All right. Uh, we'll do what we can. No elements. Next round. What I'm going to do the next turn is to move on initiative 30 using these two cards. I want to be able to uh, manipulate my initiative. Ah! That's pretty ideal, I think. That is very ideal. I was actually looking for them to draw this card. Okay, I'll take that. So the Vara Savages move first. It's important that they move before me so that I'm invincible, so I don't get take unnecessary damage. But... I need to move before the Earth Demon, otherwise it will pummel my um, Rift Tokens to shreds. So let's begin with the Elite Varraf Savage that moves 2 steps. This is the nearest Rift Token, so it will move this way. And then the Normals move 3 steps. Nice, alright. Diviner. Alright. So I've played 2 Rift cards here, a top Rift and a bottom Rift action. I'll need to think carefully about how I want to do this. So we note that there's a limitation on the... Actually on both. Right, so both are limited by the range. They are both ra uh, range 3 rifts. Which means that they can only reach 1, 2, 3. They can only reach up to this hex. I cannot put a rift token on the destination hexes. They are one short. We'll make do with what we have. Um, so we're going to move two rifts. The first rift is going to be, say, this one. This one's in huge danger. So we'll move it within range 3. We are using Void Snare first, so we activate the Disarm effect. Then the next rift we move is going to be... 
this one, this one's in immediate danger. So we need to get rid of it as soon as possible. We'll move it here. So we have done the first half. The second half, pull two. We're going to pull two the Earth Demon into this rift. Um, and that activates the disarm effect of Void Snare. So the Earth Demon takes a disarm. And the Earth Demon performs an attack 4 range 4, but it's disarmed. There's no movement. Next round. Right? First short rest. Actually, you know what? I, I think I can make do with what I have. I, I, I'm, I'm fine with uh, having only one remaining Rift card. I do have the bottom revitalizing font, don't forget. Font. I keep saying font. Uh, so that will do. I'm going to lose uh, Inspiration from Beyond. My Invis is over. The disarm is over. The short rest is done. And we can move on to the next round. The disarm rift. And move ourselves to this hex here. This can be done using seal the fate. Wonderful! Um, the viral savages do nothing. Also, uh, the earth demon takes 3 damage because it was pulled into the rift. Not that that really matters. Alright, uh, Varus Savages, they all retaliate, they all heal, they all regenerate, does not matter. Uh, oh, the Earth Demon's also doing wonderful stuff, that's really good. Alright, so my turn before the Earth Demon, I'm going to move this Rift away using Void Snare. Before that, however, I'm going to use Seal Death Fate to move 3 into this Hex, perform a ranged attack, which uh, no legal targets, so that fizzles. Then we perform Void Snare, pulling that Rift, down, oops, this the Earth Demon's here. I'll pull this Rift here. And activate the Disarm effect, which does not matter. Now the Earth Demon heals up, so it goes back to full health. Next round. Right, that was ideal, that was very ideal. Um, I think I can win. I can win right now. I just need to play Revitalizing Fount, and for the bottom to get the last rift into position and then preordain the path to move these alright so let's key in 21 and win right we win so revitalizing found rift moves here preordain the path move 2 move 2 and that's game well that went swimmingly <laughs> um, I did have a game plan a strategy coming into the solo scenario and I'm glad that it managed to come to fruition. In the first two rooms, my plan was pretty simple. Kill the normal savages. And to do so, I would channel them down the middle of both rooms along this hallway where I would place the rift tokens. So they would just have to step on four rift tokens in order for them to die. Um, moving into the second room actually requires very good timing. So every turn, the savages will draw... Um, an ability card, right? Those in the first room. And if that ability card does not have a move, uh, I would move into the second room. You saw me do that on the very first turn. Uh, the reason for doing that is because I want to keep the enemies in the second room, the savages, at the bottom of the room for as long as possible. This will give me maximum time to set up the three rifts along this hallway so that I can start inflicting damage on these savages once they move upwards. If I move into the second room 2 uh, at a bad time when they draw their move 3 or their move 5, then these savages will get to move upwards without passing through rifts and that is really bad because that makes it a lot harder to kill them. So timing is very important for this section of the game. Of course, we have to worry about the Earth Demon who keeps plodding forward, so obviously you try to avoid its attacks whenever possible. For the final two rooms, well, killing's out of the question. The Elite Savage has way too much health to kill, so instead I make a beeline, as I mentioned, uh, going, for the objective, going for the objective straight from room 2 to room 4 as quickly as possible. Then I position myself in uh, near the objective positions, which is here and here. I position myself to the right of the room and go invisible. This way, the savages in the final room are drawn back into room 3, while the remaining elite enemies will hang around rooms 2 and 3, being fo uh, drawing, uh, be yeah, the aggro is being drawn by the 4 rift tokens over there. 
So that is very important because this gives me breathing room to set up the uh, objective victory condition, which is to place all four rifts in the four positions. This requires three or four turns. So having the enemies being drawn out is very crucial as it means that I can put those rifts here without getting disrupted by enemy attacks. This is why uh, I consciously save my Cloak of Invincibility for the final room. Right? So that was my overarching strategy. Now I'll move on to optimizations. If you went for a different skill build than me, you can make the following optimizations in order to uh, improve your chances at winning the solo scenario. If your level 3 card was Envision the Course instead of Call of the Nether, you can consider using, uh, bringing along Envision the Course for its bottom action that allows you to summon two Ghost Falcons. Even though attacks are rather useless in this game, so your Ghost Falcons attacks, um, you know, they won't do damage, but they have four health each, and there are two of them, so they will soak a lot of damage from you, which is really nice. Even though it's a lost card, it can be well worth it uh, to soak damage away from your Rift tokens that way. Right, um, at level five, Dimensional Divide is way better than Seal Their Fate. This is one of your other riff, to riff actions, top riff actions, but it is very, very powerful in this particular solo scenario because of the immobilize effect. This allows you to kite the Earth Demon very easily. As long as you fire the immobilize off the Earth Demon, they will be stuck in place for two turns. One of the biggest challenges of this scenario is losing to the Earth Demon because it's elite, it hits hard, and you can't really kill it because it has six at least 60 hit points. So being able to immobilize it and stop it in its tracks for two turns is a huge help, allowing you to kill off those normal savages in the first two rooms without worrying too much about the elite of demon. Uh, this would have made the scenario a lot easier had I had access to it. At level 6, you can take careful attunement over Enfeebling Hex. It's not much different, both are rather weak actions in this solo scenario, but you might want another move 3, and it's a better move 3 than Seal Their Fate, because it actually has a useful bottom action. Uh, whenever an ally is attacked, consider any positive or 2 times modifier to be a plus 0 instead. So this is useless in the first 3 rooms, but in the final room, when all your Rift tokens are vulnerable, this could be a saving grace, allow, uh, you know, keeping your Rift tokens ensuring that your Rift Tokens don't take lethal damage. Um, it also really helps that you have 17 initiative, which uh, allows you to go, you know, to go a lot faster than your regular 20 to 30 initiative. Now, if you so choose to do the solo scenario at higher levels, you can. And I think if you have looked at the Diviner cards before, you would know that there's a huge power spike in the power level of the cards from level 7 onwards. So you really can't go wrong no matter which level 7 and 8 card you choose. At level 7, you get Ethereal Vortex, which is yet another action that allows you to move Rift Tokens, uh, which is very valuable as you saw in this particular scenario. Uh, so yeah, just like Preordain the Path, there's movement. All your rif Rifts can move together at the same time, so that could make the scenario a lot easier. The attack portion is obviously not very useful, um, at level 8, you get Anguish and Salvation, a heal 5 on any one of your rifts, even if they are far away. That's really nice. Alternatively, if you take Curative Flux or Deep Contemplation, they both have useful top halves and bottom halves as well, doing things like healing, going invisible, stunning enemies, and scrying enemy decks. So yeah, all very useful actions. Even though these are all powerful cards, I would still recommend attempting the solo scenario at Diviner level 6 because once you start ratcheting the difficulty level up, enemy monsters get increased movement, increased damage, and that is very, very bad. You saw how close this game was. Uh, the enemies were all hot on my heels and doing cr crazy amounts of damage. The Earth Demon managed to one-hit KO one of my wrists with a two-times draw. So yeah, things only get worse if you increase the scenario level. This is one solo scenario I wouldn't recommend doing at higher levels simply because it doesn't scale well with uh, offensive characters. Your attack modifier deck scales with level, but in this particular solo scenario, because attacks are fairly useless, you don't get much mileage out of being a higher level diviner. Finally, I feel that this solo scenario uh, may rub some people the wrong way because it is fairly restrictive. 
by nature of the solo scenario, it basically forces you to use riff actions as your top actions, leaving you with very little um, flexibility in that regard. But I think that's a good thing because I feel that uh, even within this restriction, there are intricacies to the different riff actions. For Cursor Ground, for example, you want to use it at a time where uh, there are a maximal number of enemies moving through riff tokens. And for Void Snare, you want to use it at a time when uh, it would mitigate the most attack damage from monsters. So yeah, even though all of them are riff actions, there are intricacies to each one, and using the correct one at the correct time is crucial to victory. It's also a refreshing test of riff token manipulation. I've not finished the Forgotten Circles campaign yet, but from what I've seen so far, there are no scenarios that, um, you know, force you to, uh, to that seriously tests you as far as uh, placing rifts and manipulating rifts and yeah, your strategy with rifts in general. So it's nice and refreshing to have a solo scenario that challenges you directly in that regard. And I must say that at the end of the day, strategizing for this scenario and finding the optimal strategy for it was pretty fun. So big thanks to Marcel for again designing such a wonderful solo scenario. I thoroughly enjoyed it and I hope you did too. And hopefully you learned something from this video as well. If you have any comments or suggestions for this video, leave it, leave it in the comments. If you found any uh, rules mistakes I've committed, well, it can't be helped, but just let me know in the comments. As always, thanks for watching. Goodbye.